Ow, oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental Tire from Kansas City. I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Chuck D, Charlie Davies, David G, David Goss doesn't yeah, sound not as good. good. Yeah, I tried to go for <laughs> it, and I was like, you know, when Charlie does it, we have our pre-meeting clap, and we're syncing up, and it sounds so good, and I'm hyped, and I was like, oh, we'll try to start something new with Dave, and... I don't know. Yeah. I don't think Andrew W doesn't exactly work well either. So we'll just let Charlie have it. You can be big dub. Big dub? Yeah, that's a that's a win. That it could be. It dub could City. Be, depending you on how we're counting my COVID weight, but DG. DG. Yeah, DG. DG, yeah, DG could work. Yeah. All right. We're we're on to something. I don't know what it is exactly that we're on to. Big show today. We are uh, happy to be here. Happy that it is soccer for all week. Happy to celebrate everybody. In the world, everybody who loves this beautiful game in this league, in this podcast, everybody is welcome. Everybody. There are no exceptions here. doesn't matter. Race, color, religion, national origin, gender, gender identity, disability, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status, or anything else that you could fall, you could find to put under those uh, umbrellas there. I hope that everyone saw the special podcast we put on on Wednesday. Nick Fershaw is back. No, not doing his greetings, greetings, and welcome, but back producing uh, podcasts that go on our channel. It's a story about power soccer and about the impact it can have on kids' lives, those athletes. Uh, an incredible story. Go give it a listen. It's about 20 minutes long, so it's not going to take much of your time. Nick is an incredible podcast producer, like one of the best. I love his paternal podcast, you know, if you didn't know. Father here, Chuck and I, you know, we're on that train. Uh, but he is in, he's just incredible, so talented on that front. And in this show, we have a really special interview with Sean Davis. I actually did not know that Sean Davis was Asian. His mother is Japanese. She's an absolute star in her own right on TikTok. I'm going to go make some of her recipes. You go check her out. But Sean comes on this show, and we'll have that a little bit later after we go through the midweek action, after we preview the weekend before we get to the mailbag, to talk about his background, to talk about the dichotomy in his family's background. Uh, I won't tell his story for him, but I do want you to know out there that it is um, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It's an important month. Asian hate continues. It is real. It is ever present. Uh, I don't know how it is in your houses at home, but in our house, we see all the videos. We see all the headlines. We understand what's happening to people, and I understand that it can affect my family, and it's affecting thousands of families around this country, millions around the world. So uh, we'll have a great conversation with him. So look forward to that. At MLSsoccer.com, you can always check out Steve Zakwani's breakdown. It's Saturdays. It's the 27 Thoughts on Mondays. It's also Midweek Takeaways. We had our first midweek action in league this week. And Matt Doyle's midweek column is always going to make you smarter. He talked about FC Cincinnati, and they've got a big weekend. They open TQL Stadium on Fox against Inter-Miami on Sunday. Let's get right into it. And let's start with the Sounders, because this is producing Anders' podcast. He owns this thing. He runs it. He puts together rundowns. I actually did this one, but in his honor and in Alex Roldan's honor, we will talk about yet another win for the Shield winners. Two Roldan moments. A Christian Roldan left foot volley banger. And then Alex rolled on, goes into goal after Stefan Fry gets hurt, and it didn't look good. We hope for the best for Stefan Fry. Makes a couple saves against the Earthquakes, like rides out a one nothing win, and the Sounders didn't play well, and they're still atop the table. Dave, hey. thoughts on thoughts on this one from just a strictly rolled on perspective? Got to be a proud one for the parents, huh? As a younger brother, I know Alex rolled on's experience of being like, I went in goal, I saved the game. Christian's going to be the one who's got his name on the uh, on the game winning goal. Everyone's going to call and be like, Christian, what a goal, goal of the year, unreal. And you're just sitting back there and being like, I thought I did my job. I thought I did pretty well. So uh, I, I understand that experience. I feel you, <laughs> Alex. For every B plus, my sister got an A. For every A, she got an A plus. That's the way the world works. I appreciate it, but it was awesome. And respect, like those weren't easy plays for Alex uh-uh. Roldan in goal. The free kick from San Jose bouncing in the box. Yeah. It's a dangerous moment. That's a dangerous play. I think uh, – Kaylor Navas struggled with it in the Champions League. So Alex Rodon, pretty good game. And altogether, I thought it was a fun game. San Jose was all over the place, as you expect them to be. Seattle, I think, handled it fairly well. San Jose should have gotten something out of this game mm-hmm. for the chances they created. That's what Seattle's doing right now, though, is they're bend but don't break. And they've got guys up front who, like Christian did, like Rui Diaz still does, even when he doesn't get a goal. They're going to create opportunities, and they're always going to have a chance to win. And there was a little break to this, too, because Jordi Delem goes out really early, and he had moved into that sort of three-center back role there and knew who was at left back. They had to change a couple things up. Schmetzer went back to it. They didn't win the expected goal battle, but they won the game. Here's the quote that Charlie and I can identify with as, 
older brothers. Quote, Christian just threw my name out there and said it was better if I went in goal and he stayed in the midfield, said uh, Alex Roldan. That decision came between them two, I'm meaning Christian and the coaching staff. Yeah, that's the way it goes. You look at your younger brother like, yeah, dad said go load the dishwasher, man. He yeah. just, he, you need to go do that. Go hey, do I'm it. hungry. Where's my sandwich at? I'm thirsty. Please go upstairs and get me a glass of water. If you would like to play video games later, you're going to need to do some things to earn that privilege because I'm on the sticks right now. And Christian's on the sticks. That's the way it works. Yeah, I, I love the fact, too, that he said, it's better if I'm on the field. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in goal, okay? So just go go put the gloves on. And, uh, yeah, the, the team will be A-OK with me in the on the pitch in the middle. So. So the only thing I'm upset about is I think I made a comment on the show a year or two ago where I said, if you put Christian Roldan in center field or as point guard or at cornerback, he would make it like he's a gamer. He's an unreal athlete. He sees the game, but he battles through everything. It would have proven my point if he had gone in goal and played fantastically in goal where I'm like, Christian Roldan's a great soccer player, but he's also just a great competitor and athlete. And uh, he took that moment away from me. That's on you, Christian. He had and the, I will he, never say that again. He had the left foot of volley. Once you have the left foot of volley yeah. and the laser beam goal, you're like, he's me? a ten now, right? What am I? What are you talking about? He's a Nico's luxury player. I run this team. Yeah. Am, this is my team. Until Nico gets back, don't look anywhere else. Alex, you're in goal, man. Go pull him on. Get on the gloves. It's all good. Uh, yeah, look, there's a big game coming up for Seattle this weekend. I don't take any demerits away from San Jose. I feel like San Jose have been extremely manic and are still a little bit manic, but they're a little bit less manic, if that makes sense. Like, they're still staying true to their, like, hey, we're going to man mark, we're going to throw 10 guys up in the box on a short corner, we're going to do weird stuff that you don't always understand, but it feels like there's less of that, like, shoe falling off side where you, like, blink your eyes and they're down 4 well, nothing. I would also say with Tanner Beeson, the way he's played, especially with Cade Cowell's addition, uh, and rometty has been awesome since the first week of the season, I think they've gotten more athletic, and so they can do more of the things that Matias Almeida expects rather than Alanis getting totally isolated yeah. or um, the Georgian center back whose name I can't remember yeah, right I'm now. Yeah, I'm spacing on it right now. Ka- not Kwasha really, because that uh, was the winger. Whatever yeah. it was. Uh, those Kasia, players, Grim Kasia. There you go. Those players were put in positions that they literally couldn't handle. And I think that's less of the case now. And the only thing for me is when Andy Rios comes on the field, a lot of it dies. He can't play. He's just not a part of this system to me at all. He's not a creator in that spot. He can't stretch the line like Cade Cowell can. He can't really press and and hurt you in that way. So I think they really lose a lot, even though Wando has been good off the bench um, when he gets those opportunities. But it feels like Fierro's more comfortable Chofi has given them an element where you know when you get the ball into his feet, at least he'll find you and you can make runs. And I think the back line has more time to get up the field because he doesn't lose it as quickly. And so there's been added elements to this that have made San Jose better under Almeida, and it's probably the best group he's had since he's been there. I think Marcinkowski is an upgrade from what they were on, but he still has some moments, let's call them. He's a young goalkeeper. He still has some Mm -hmm. moments where like, oh, positioning-wise, decision-making right there, that might cost him just a little bit. Uh, San Jose has a big game coming up this weekend as well. I mean, we got through midweek, but they're right back at it. They are hosting the Portland Timbers, so they stay with Cascadia. We'll see how that one goes for them. Uh, But the Timbers have, uh, excuse me, Seattle have a massive game this weekend. It's the Better Than Bob Bowl, LAFC coming to town, 9.30 p.m. Eastern. It's the final game of the weekend on Sunday on FS1 Fox Deportes. We you have guys, this email. What, I ahead. was just going to say, you guys saw last week knew who or, or Rui Diaz laid down in the wall? I think yeah. someone's going to lay down in the wall this time. I think it's fully established now for Seattle. Yeah, they figured it out. Once that Tuesta went under, they're like, uh, yeah, but the other time, like, Rui Diaz was going down in the wall. One, why Rui Diaz? And then I know. The wall positioned? It's like, and what? What's going on here? Why is it Charlie, really? Is Al- that's Alex Roldan's job, man. Yeah, Alex, yeah. get down on the ground. You take I'm that. Not, I'm not lying down. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> if, if, even if the coach is like, hey, Chuck, get down, lie there, take one for the team. I'm like, there's got to be someone else. There's got <laughs> to be someone else. I'm a goal scorer, man. I can't yeah. lay down. Well, that's I, a good I, question. How do you settle on that guy? Just from a team perspective, Charlie, how would you, you know, let's say you're Christian Roldan in the situation. You're looking around. You're like, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Who, who's the one that lays down? 
Charlie's got two twins, and they're deciding which one's going to lay down behind the wall right now. Yeah, yeah that's not Is it Dakota? Did Dakota that's get thrown under the if, if fatherhood works and Charlie's laying down, he might not on his team, but in his home life, he's the one laying down under the wall taking the shot. That's yeah. the way fatherhood works. It, it is. It really is. Uh, you know, I always thought about this because that was one thing I hated as a player. I really did. Whenever there's a, a, a wall, I was like, oh, is the striker going to be in the wall? I was like, hey, we got to play for the counter. Let me be <laughs> – I got to be I gotta be at the half field line and pull, maybe I'll, we'll pull two guys back. You know, that's the plan. But then they're always like, all right, I'm either behind, like orchestrating the wall because I'm like, yeah, keep the keeper on the line. I, I got it. You know, yeah, a little to the left, a little to the – yeah, perfect. And then I just, you know, stroll back. <laughs> yeah. Just start to inch backwards. Like, all right, you guys got this, right? Yeah, you're or, good. It's- or you're the runner and – you have the wall, and then you're like, "All right, guys, I'm gonna be the one take on the it off, they touch yeah. it, right? I'm the you guys, you guys stay packed, don't move, uh, and I'll intervene if if they right. do tap." And it. Charlie yeah. walks by the free kick takers. He turns and goes, "If you play it short, <laughs> I won't chase. Just yeah. play it short." Yeah. Yeah. Gooch so, is watching this pod, being like, "We know you, Charlie. That's why you always set up the wall." Yeah, perfect. But because I've taken one to the face, you jump up and you t- oh. And it, it 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 stuns you for a good ten minutes. After you're just like I, that's the worst thing you can do as a striker if you're like getting the wall, yeah. and then and then the ball ends up finding you in the face. And look, or a right the, back, a right back can take it, right? A younger brother can take that, but your star striker, older brother, no, no chance. <laughs> uh, we have an email here from Nick in Honolulu about LAFC. Aloha team, he says. I love the pod, and you guys rock. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. I don't quite understand why most of the ETR cast has such a high opinion of LAFC. The team has had a slow start to the season. By the way, they're 11th in the West right now. Last season, their performance was mediocre. Their defense is lacking, even with Vela and Rossi, and Vela we don't know about right now. They can't seem to get past the Sounders and past MLS Cup playoffs. Taylor Twelman mentioned in-game commentary that their expected goals is almost the same with or without Vela. I actually went and looked that up. It is pretty close. Please explain your reasoning for being behind LAFC so strongly, Mahalo. Uh, I would say their defense isn't lacking. They're now one of the best defensive units in the league. Oasis Nate is playing in the full-time edition of Jesus Murillo, and it should get better with Kim Moon Wan now finally coming back at right back. They've got options at left back between Farfan and Palacio. So I would disagree that defensively they have issues, and that's by saying they may have struggled so far this year, but they haven't lost games because they don't give up goals. And they're hard to score against. And then on the flip side, in the attack, I think, yeah, it hasn't looked LAFC-esque. But Corey Baird clearly fits this. And Diego Rossi now is finally coming back. So if you look at what they were last year, you take away Vela for a large stretch of the year. If they had added Corey Baird last year, Corey Baird, they would have been better in the attack. So I still think all those elements exist. They're better defensively. And there is an element of you trust Bob. That if it doesn't look good for two weeks, that it'll get there over the course of this season because he's a perfectionist and he's had that group play that way their entire time together. I still see the ideas in the midfield. I just don't think we're seeing like 2019 cutting edge from LAFC. And that's obvious. That's because we sort of have accustomed ourselves to seeing and wanting and believing in this LAFC team that's just so utterly dominant both collectively and individually that they blow the wheels off people. They're not there yet. But look, remember, they're the only team yeah, I think that has a result team. against yeah. against the Sounders. They don't have Carlos Vela. The Golden Boot winner last year, Diego Rossi, is just now getting back, just now getting sharp. He just got a goal. This could be the beginning of a flood. Like, the reason why you have faith in LAFC is because, one, the roster is deep, it's super talented, and it's been mostly together. They've added sort of the complementary pieces that can elevate them. Yes, number nine continues to be sort of a larger question mark. And keeper. But, yeah, and, and keeper, but I think Cisnega is he's yeah, answering a lot of those questions. He's answering a lot of those questions right now. It's not been long term, but I, I believe that he's he's good enough to elevate them to the point where they believe they should be and their roster says that they should be. It is Carlos Vela. I, I really I really think that. They're going to be a top team in the West with Diego Rossi and the crew they have around. If they have Carlos Vela healthy and, and ready to go, they are among the top teams in the league. Now that's a big question mark right now. Charlie, what's your read on the Vela situation? We just we haven't seen him. We haven't gotten information on him. We asked Max Bredos on Twitter Spaces on Tuesday. Doyle and I did. We do that at 11 a.m. Eastern. Every Tuesday, we go through all 27 teams. I think Dave's going to pinch hit for me this cup, upcoming week. So, obviously, it will be a much, much better show. Uh, I don't know with, about my chemistry with Doyle. 
He's not a Charlie to me. I don't know if I don't know if our attributes fit that. The one way. twos aren't on aren't quite yeah. timed as right. Yeah, but yeah, like, we'll see. Bredos, I asked Bredos, I was like, what is up with Vela? What do you know about this? And he's like, honestly, I know what you know. Somebody needs to ask about this in the press conference. It blows my mind that people aren't just like banging down Bob's door about this. What is your read on, on Carlos Vela's situation right now? From from what I understand, he had a knock. There was an injury, and he's trained. Could he had, I think he trained two days prior to the to the El Trafico match. And they're like, it's too early on in the year. We're not risking injuring him for long term because that's the worst thing you can possibly have possibly uh, happen is have him have a setback and then you're missing Carlos Vela for two months and then next thing you know it's going to take him another two months to get fit so you you take a cautious approach to one of the best players in the league if not the best when he's fit and in form so it's early on the year it's it's just May 13th I think you give him time to get back to fully that full fitness and it's and it's really pushing the envelope with strength and conditioning and and then once he's really feeling good then you can integrate him into into matches but i think you really just focus on training right now and and ramping up that before you start playing him 90 minutes and, and looking to get the most out of carlos vela we all know time. it's at the end of the year that's what matters yeah so yeah so why why push him now I I'm on that side. I'm on kid gloves, Carlos Vela team. Like you just don't don't risk it. This is nope. the difference between you accomplishing your goals and not. But look, this is a massive game. And I said it. The last two playoffs, LAFC have gone out to the Sounders. They did get, I think, as one one draw earlier this year uh, with Seattle. But Seattle are the best team in the league. This is an opportunity. Even you know, 11th place in the West. Who cares right now? My mm -hmm. opinion is we don't really know that much about MLS in this current junction and all these teams. We have first impressions. But those first impressions are going to change really quickly once you start to hit summer, change in weather, change in form for a lot of these teams, injuries, and then midweeks just starting to stack up. That's when we're going to really learn a lot. We'll see, though. 9.30 p.m. Eastern, Seattle, LAFC. It finishes the weekend on FS1. Thank you, Nick and Honolulu, for hitting us up. We appreciate you, man. Mahalo. Uh, Charlie, can I ask you this? Was it a foul on Turner? Uh oh was, was that ever? Was that a foul on Turner? Union and Rev ever? split the points 1-1. Come on. Anybody in the world could have seen that it was clear and obvious that Shabilko took his arm and it, and it elbow and collided with Matt Turner's face. It's a foul. He didn't make contact with the ball. And I, I said it on, on air. Both players are entitled to go for the ball. And it hap sometimes it happens where the striker collides with, with the keeper. But if they're both going up, there, there's no foul. And I've been on, I've been on the, the wrong end of, of calls where I'm just going up for the ball. The keeper collides into me. I get called for the foul. I'm like, of course. And you tap the keeper, it's a foul. In this instance, Shabilko. Innocent Charlie, always innocent. Always. Never, yeah. all, I, never, I never bump into the goalie. Come on. But in this instance, Shabilko is going into Matt Turner, initiates the contact with his arm, connects, does not touch the ball, a rebound comes to him as Matt Turner goes to the ground, and he scores. It's a foul, and what, what, I guess, and it's and it's okay sometimes. Referees, Tori Penso was was the ref. You miss it because it, it happening so fast. But that's what VAR was brought to the game for to get these calls right. That's what's shocking to me. How does it not even go to VAR? How is it clear and obvious that that was not an error? And that's the concern for me because I'm, I'm all for VAR because we want to get calls right. But where's the consistency? How does that not even get checked? Tori Penso should be going to the monitor and say, okay, I saw that. I was there. That's not a foul. Good. At least it got checked. But for it not to be even checked, and it was clear and obvious. Well, it was it checked. It was yes, checked. To the everything monitor. checked. Yeah, to yeah. The for the, not flat. For the I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you. I didn't really blame Tori Pinso in the moment. I'm watching the game. I had to go back multiple times and watch yeah. multiple replays. Because Shabilko's like turned yeah. back, puts his elbow in, and the ref's behind. It's fine. But to Charlie's point, you've got people watching it on video. Uh, although I'm pretty sure Anders texted and said he thought Matt Turner was being soft in that moment. Whoa. I'm just out Whoa. here. I'm just this, the messenger, man. Whoa, I'm just the messenger. The sanctity of the group chat has been besmirched. Yeah, you can't Anders say anything false. in there. Anders says false. Hey, 
We all know that's hashtag content, so be where you put Tell me that wasn't a foul. Tell me that wasn't a foul. No, I wa- in watching it live, my reaction was, watching it live, I didn't see it. And then on Same. the replay, I Same. said, oh, actually, that looks like a foul. Yes. And I thought it was going to get called back. So that that I, I agree it's with like, everything you said. His arms are outstretched. It's not like they're up like this. Yeah, yeah. agreed. It's out it's across. Out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's out. And he doesn't get he doesn't get the ball. So and when that happens, I, yeah, it's a foul to me. It's a foul. Yeah. Till Bunbury with the goal for the Revs. It was. Well, so I was just gonna say it was bizarre that these two teams kind of went toe to toe for a while, but it was sort of a slow game for large stretches, mm-hmm. and then you get what. Could have been or was three. Now I can't even remember. It was 1 1, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but also could have been 2 1 in like seven minutes to close out the game. And I think part of that for the Revs, Charlie is, I, I don't know his name right now off the top of my head, but the Icelandic winger, he's just not in form yet. Yeah. Arnold, and so Trist- Arnold Tristison. And it feels like some of the attacks dying when it gets through to him. Mm-hmm. And then part of it was it felt like the Revs went for it with their subs in bringing on Gustavo Bo. And Bunbury, it felt like Bruce said, I'm going to go for three points rather than sit for one. Which yeah, I thought, the team. They were the better team. Yeah, and I thought that was a good sign from them, even on the road, to say to make that decision. So, yeah. I, I wonder if that's going to be what we see a lot in these midweek sort of glut on the back end of the summer. Into if the you fall, steal is, three is, points every other yeah, week. Trying to like than figure out how to manage through 80 minutes and not give up anything catastrophic and then be in a position to change the game with your subs, especially because you have five now and that gives you more options to come in and, and have guys come in and still say, okay, I have something left in the tank if I need later on. But can you, can we talk about Carlos heel as a 10 when he's in the middle of the pitch and he's involved and he's getting opportunities and just one of the best attacking midfielders I've ever seen in this league. I'm not even, I'm not playing the way he moves his first touch, even his second touch, the way he can set up, you know, a, a pinging a ball across the pitch, switching fields, his vision, just a really, really one of the best players I've seen in that position. If I had to compare it to someone, I would say when he's when he's waiting to receive the ball in the half turn, he almost looks like Danny Leva. And then when he hits those big switches, it's Darwin Jones-esque. So he's reaching that peak of some of the best players <laughs> in the history of this league. And when it comes down to close down, Ethan Dobler, I mean, he's like, he yeah. can really just close the space. Yeah, so, so Carlos this, Heels, yeah, he's scratching that that ceiling. This is for you, Anders, all of it. Uh, this is for you. We got you riled up now, Charlie. We got you emotional here. The union went out and signed a new uh, ten, Daniel Gazdag, out of uh, uh, out of Hungary yeah. from Hanved. Mm-hmm. Uh, they really like him. He's his That's name's not great. Anthony Fontana, though. Well, this is the thing. They, they cry. We don't have a ten. We don't have a ten. Did you give Anthony Fontana, who showed last year what he's capable of in moments? It wasn't consistent, but he did show scoring goals and creating. He comes into the match as a substitute and. And runs by four or five revolution players in one sequence. He dribbles by four or five. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that not a 10? And he was looking to pass in combined and plays off plays off, uh, off of the strikers. How do you not give him a run of games? You start the season in Columbus, and he's playing as a striker, not a 10. And how many times have we seen him play underneath Sergio Santos and Casper Shabilko, who are the two preferred strikers. For me, if you have a young player who's come up through the academy, and I saw him in 2017 when he was training training with us as a young kid, that he showed he had the quality, the confidence, and the skill. Sure, they gave Brandon Aronson the keys to that position, and Brandon Aronson took off, and now he's, he's still continuing to rise in, in Austria. But give Fontana the opportunity to make the most of his ability in that position. They haven't done that. That's why I'm shocked. Give him four, a run of four or five games, which you see across Europe. If he doesn't succeed, then okay. He's not, he's not the guy. We gave him a run. Now you're bringing in another 10, another number 10 from, from uh, Europe. W- what do you do with him? If you're not, if now he's not going to get the opportunity, trade him. He has great value. Trade him. And let's see if he can take off somewhere else. But aren't we sitting around talking about how everyone has to earn a spot and competition makes you better and being pushed and that's what makes players stronger? And if and if they don't think today that he's the starting 10 for their team, if they don't think he's Brendan Aronson, whether they don't think it is for the long term or for right now, then you don't give him that spot, right? And so right now, Jamiro Montero gives them the best chance to win as a 10, even 
which I think is a bit of an indictment to Fontana. With Ortiz out, with Martinez out, they slid Flack back and started McGlynn on the side of the triangle rather yep. than give Fontana the chance, which shows you where the coaching staff in front office thinks about him. So why right. not bring in a good 10 from Europe that you think has potential and put him in your club? And maybe that means Montero moves. Maybe that means he I plays no as one two forwards. That. I have no problem with that. My my point is then sell uh, trade him. Yeah, trade him. But why, why, I don't why keep him. I don't might, want to see get, look. He might get the run though, because God's dog's not supposed to come until June, and then I'm pretty sure. What are are Hungary in the Euros? Yeah, yeah. So I think he's in with Hungary. I think he'll probably be at the Euros as well. So yeah, there my, there is an my, opportunity, and then it's it's Anthony Fontana's chance. I mean, he, he has to take that right. He has to prove to Jim Curtin and a team that has big ambition. But that Charlie, mm-hmm. I guess, well, I guess what you're saying is trade him. Uh, my point is, Jim Curtin has proven that if he thought he could play, he would, right? If he thought he was the best guy at that spot, he'd give him that chance. Well, I've seen, I've seen my, from my opportunity at the Philadelphia Union, that that's not always the case. Oh, okay. So, so sometimes the best players in training or the best players for the moment, whether it's a week, two weeks, a month, two months, whatever it is. I've seen with my own eyes that those players sometimes don't get the benefit of the doubt. So Wait. with with my experience, I would say either you let him go now and trade him because I am sick of young, talented players in this country getting pushed down or moved to the side for another European player who maybe is just as good or maybe a, a shade better Allow that player, that young American player, to go play somewhere else then. Don't hold them back, and then you lose two or three years of that of that chance to really progress and, and reach your potential, and it's done. There, there's, no, there's, no, there's no place for you to improve or play, so therefore you get lost in the shuffle. I don't want to see that happen to Fontana because I saw with my own eyes, along with all the other players on that roster in 2017, that the kid can ball. That he has would, a bright future. So that's my point. Yeah, it would be interesting point. to see what the trade market would be because we saw what Mihailovic went for. We saw what Frankie Amaya went for. They all had more MLS starting experience than him, but he scored goals. And goals cost money, but at the same time, he's a young guy. So it would be really interesting to see if he was out there, and especially if the idea is, well, he's coming in as a 10, which is a high-value position for a lot of teams. It would be interesting to see what the trade market looked like. Yeah, it would be. Four zero one two zero six zero MLS extra time to dot com. If you're a team or a fan of a team and you think, hey, Anthony Fontana would belong, or, or I mean, Montreal on would have been one. Yeah, would have. I don't know why I was, I was thinking honestly San Jose here for a half second. I know they have trophies now, but like, I think I think that could have worked too. We'll see what happens. Uh, for now, though, they've got a bunch of good players to the Union, and they play the Red Bulls this week on ESPN Plus. Might hit that in our ESPN Plus game of the weekend. Something uh, interesting, political, complicated. Toronto FC signed Dom Dwyer. Didn't expect that to happen, not going to lie. Io's back, Josie's back, it seems, and now you go get Dom Dwyer when you also have Patty Mullins and other options as well. Jordan Peruzza. Good. I knew I, you would be I, here to I had, me up with I the other, the home yeah. other options. Who's got unreal flow. This, this is a weird signing. Yeah, weird. it makes no sense. The assumption is it's a pretty cheap number and he needed somewhere to go. We know, obviously, Toronto's in Orlando, uh, and... I, there was, uh, you could see him on the bench during one of the CCL games, I think against Leon. So he's clearly down there with them training. I think there's a bit of a connection through to Chris Armas, through some of the guys he's worked for in Orlando and some of the guys that Chris uh, values pretty highly. Yeah, I, I don't. I think we're probably making a bigger deal of this than we should because Dom Dwyer is a big name and has scored goals in big moments in this league and has moved around at times. And this signing seems like it should have happened at center back. The we don't know what we have, but maybe it'll work, guy. That seems to be the position that Toronto needs for that, not the seventh legit center forward, right? Because none of the guys you named can play on the wing or will play underneath comfortably. Uh, Patrick Mullins did off the bench yesterday, whatever. Uh, so that's the weirdest part about that whole setup. What's the ceiling for Toronto in your mind, Charlie? Because they went midweek and they handled the crew. And we have been mm-hmm. all over the crew, all yeah. preseason, post MLS Cup, throughout the playoffs, into CCL. We were hooting and hollering about the crew being this incredible team, could be a historic team, and mm-hmm. a Toronto Seaside that had kind of been middling, but had been missing Pozuelo and Josie and Io, and now have Soteldo, and now have Kamar Lawrence at left back. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, oh, well then, they could be real good. 
the ceiling is extremely high if you keep everyone healthy. And what we saw from Josie Altador too was I saw a little bit of fire yeah. from Josie Altador. I, I saw a response, something I've been waiting for. I said, I, I, it's almost like I want to be like, hey, Josie, let's go. You got too much left in the tank. Don't, don't just throw it all away. Come back with, with some energy. Give me, give me what you got. He showed me right just from that substitute appearance. I, I have what it takes to make a difference in this league. And I'm, I'm not ready to just take the crown off and say, you know, I'm, I'm out. So when you see him bang that, that shot off the post, I, th- I said, okay, this is, this is the Josie I've been waiting for. Give me something more that you throw in an Akinola, you throw in Soteldo, and you throw in Pozuelo, and then you throw in a, a hungry Michael Bradley saying, hey, you guys forgetting about me. It's almost like you're just casting me to the side thinking I'm just going to give up on the U.S. men's national team and I'm just going to give up on ambition. I'm not done yet either. You you need that if you're Toronto for Chris Armas and you want that. You want to see that response. This team can be really tough to beat, really tough to beat. If everyone's healthy and you talk about the chemistry between a Soteldo, Soteldo and a Pozuelo for the creative aspect of this Toronto team, which makes them not predictable. If, I feel if like we could- this is, a, sort of, this is a difficult team to play. We against. sort of forgot that they were like basically just going to win the Supporters Shield last year and had the MVP, mm-hmm. and just started. I didn't, to, I, I didn't forget either, but I fe- I don't know how, but I feel like kind of the expectations that I had just sort of kind of trickled down. Just yeah, I mean, a, coaching change makes it tough, and the reality of the situation for all three Canadian teams, I think, makes it tough to think they'll compete for Supporters Shield, not having any home games for who knows how long. Not going home, all of that, but from pure soccer quality. They're the best team in this league, and they've only added to that. Are you kidding me? We're talking about a team that uh, Charlie mentioned all these people and didn't mention Jonathan Osorio, who didn't play in this game, who was their team MVP over the last, you know, two years ago and three years ago, and is one of the best two-way midfielders in this league. Didn't mention Marky Delgado. The way Ralph Preso played last night alongside Michael, Michael was awesome. But it's only possible because Ralph Preso can play both ways at the level he's done. Kamar Lawrence comes in. They still have Aro. They have Richie. So I don't know what's going to happen there. But it gives them options from pure soccer quality and the ability to play with the ball and technique and soccer vision. This is the best team in the league. And I would say to Charlie's point about Josie, and Charlie knows this better than anyone, Josie loves to have pieces around him that he can play off of and use and manipulate the game and find spacing and set up at times and then have you know work off of that and that's what he's got in this team and that's what you saw in that shot that hit the post right he floats out left and he cycled the ball through that triangle three times waiting for the spacing the way he wanted it and he had Soteldo alongside him and I think it was Mullins or Ayo whoever it was that's just pure talent around him and at his best in 2017 it was Vasquez underneath him and Javinko over him and he had options on the wing and he was dangerous and so all of this fits a lot of ways. I don't know how Chris is going to play it. Armis, is he going to press that's high a, at times? That's a, well, that's a, well, that's the challenge. Yeah, making it work. But five v five, agreed. They'll smoke people. <laughs> so, you also didn't mention you didn't mention like center back and goalkeeper, which is going to be important too. We'll yeah. see how that works out for them. But New England uh, hosts Columbus this weekend on ESPN two on Sunday at six p.m. Eastern. The crew reband, rebrand uh, had not come out on Monday when we had this show. It has now come out. You've Oof. seen the reaction, all the news coming around it. There's a back and forth between the Nordeca and uh, the crew ownership group. We will continue to call them the crew. That is still, even with this rebrand, like their moniker, their name. It hasn't gone anywhere, I guess, uh, although outside of the official name. Um, look, I, I will just say this about it, and my personal opinion is that my opinion doesn't really matter. I'm not a supporter of the club. I am not a steward of the club. I'm not an owner of the club. I'm not a player of the club. I'm not a coach of the club. I'm just some guy on the internet that talks about Major League Soccer a couple times a week. I understand why uh, why the ownership group that has come in, the Haslam family and, and, and uh, Dr. Edwards, decided that they wanted to have a, a fresh mark, let's say, a fresh crest, a fresh look. It is, it is a different moment now. The crew were saved. They have this new stadium. They have this new training facility. You know, what was there before was created by a previous group of people that they're trying to move past from as a club. So I get why they're trying to do this, and now it's really up to uh, the club, the ownership, and the fans to come to some sort of agreement or to move forward together. And I'm interested to see how that happens. You see statements flying back and forth. Of course, the reaction has been, has been very public from, uh, from all sides involved. 
Uh, but I think I can speak for all of us when we're not going to stop calling them the Columbus Crew. That is still what they are, uh, and and we'll see what happens going forward. That's I have no insight. I'm just following it like the rest of you. I'm, yeah. I'm, inter- I'm interested to know what the rest of Major League Soccer thinks. The fans, not the cl- crew fans. We know how they feel. It saved the crew. But what does the rest of the league think? Well, if you're a fan and you you know what the Columbus crew are about, how, how they just won MLS Cup, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing? Are you happy with clubs, how they rebrand? Or, or do you like the original names? I, I'm, I'm curious to know what, what people think. I'll say for me, I'm glad they're wearing black and gold still. I'm glad they're still playing Columbus. I'm glad they're good. I'm glad they're building that franchise to be even bigger. You always want the supporters to feel heard and be a part of it because that's, I mean, for this club especially, but for every club in MLS, that's the lifeblood of these groups. Um, So it'll be interesting. And It sounds like the Columbus front office is meeting with Nordeca. They've made some announcements about that over the course of this week. But uh, I'm excited to watch them play soccer. And I'm excited to get back uh, to Columbus at some point, hopefully for an MLS playoff game again this year. Because when it's cold and windy in Columbus, that's when it goes off. Those are great games. We'll see what it feels like in the new stadium, too. That's the flip side of this. They have a beautiful new building that's going to open up. Some other news from midweek. Hey, Loons win. You guys want to say Wonderwall or... So like, it was pretty cool watching anyway, it on TV. It, it, took, hey, it took a while, but I'm, yeah. I'm happy. I'm That's happy. an emotional wonder wall for them, right? Uh, we had somebody text us and say, I wish Adrian Heath had a Twitter account. Oh, I wish he had a Twitter account too. <laughs> I don't think he needs one because he says whatever the heck he wants to say on like the post-game nah. shows. So it is what it is. And he still, uh, he, he still listens to all of us too. Mm. You know he that. finally gets the win. He goes post-game interview with, uh, with Kendra and Callum. And I think his first answer was like, the things people refuse to talk about, the blocks, the effort, it's all there. And it's like, who are they in this scenario? <laughs> but uh, it was interesting to me because I actually felt this was the opposite of the Rapids game. The Rapids game, they were phenomenal the first 25, 30 minutes. And then it all started to fall apart. They started to give up chances. They were gappy. They looked leggy. This game, I think they struggled at times in the first half. Vancouver hasn't scored from open play. They were this close multiple times, but especially one time they were that close. Uh, And then it felt like Minnesota. Yeah. And and it felt like Minnesota started to build and Ramon Abila gets the goal. uh, And it was a great moment for him and his family, his celebration after his brother uh, took his own life last year and struggled with depression and his celebration to reward him in mental health awareness month. And our hearts go out to his family. And it was really emotional to watch that. But it wasn't just the goal from him. He came on the field. He misses an early chance. And you could see him turn to the team and say, more, more, let's keep it going. And the energy ramped up from that moment on for this Minnesota team. And I thought they were they were better going into that. But he really changed the game. And they talked about, uh, Adrian, he talked about his fitness. He wants to play. He's eager to play. Maybe we didn't handle it as well as we could, but we want him to get that opportunity. But he started to look like he he's reaching it. Yeah, it's not uh, perfect by any means. But they don't care, man. They got to they, they gotta win, and that's all that matters. Uh, how about the Derek Jones game? Is that what we're calling Ooh, it? Ooh, hell the, yes. The Derek Jones game for Houston, knocking off Sporting Kansas City. D just comes in and just runs somebody over, runs down the throw of the defense. I mean, look, it, I don't know if he made the final pass, but he got in a position for mm-hmm. Maxi to do his thing. Big win for Houston. The press is working pretty well for them. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, I'll give them a grade of incomplete for productive build out and attacking chance creation. Get out of here. Do not just dis- this team was up 1 0. And press them. KC off the field in the last 10 minutes. No team in MLS, not even the Red Bulls, have tried to do that over the last year. There's no Houston team that's out here playing. I respect it. I pr- I do too. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to take it down. I'm just saying the ceiling also, could be tab, higher. Also, getting thrown out, and you could see he was ready to pump the crowd up, Simeone style. Didn't do it. Classy, <laughs> but he's got he's got the the tie clip he's doing, on. He's doing the suit. Yeah, he's doing the suit, but he could go full Simeone. He could go all black. Now that yeah. is a statement in Houston. He maybe should do that in these cooler months on the road, but we'll see how it goes. Also, uh, some other stuff from the week, uh, midweek here. Uh, producing honors, reminder of the day. One of our own, one of our own. Bjorn Janssen, he is one of our own. Bjorn does it for General Sal and Taquito. We know he loves the cats on this show uh, and also enjoys us. So, Bjorn, if you're listening, well done, man. Big dub for uh, Club de Foot Montreal against Only Inter Miami. Only took five and a half hours. Oh, my God. Yeah, the the weather delays here. I just kept going back to it. I was like, is this going to be going again? Is it going? No, it's not going. Inter Miami, uh, honestly, a little nondescript. They go to Cincinnati. 
this weekend, and Cincinnati's going to open up TQL Stadium on Big Fox on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. They also announced here on this Thursday that the Jeff Cameron signing is officially official. <laughs> this is a wonderful day for soccer in the United States, Sunday. For soccer in Cincinnati, for the club, for ownership, for all the fans that have really packed it out since day one. I mean, you go back to Nipper, you go you go back from, like, from the jump. This community, this fan base... Uh, said that's our team, and we're going to support that team, and oh, by the way, we're going to support them through thick and then also very thin. It's been quite thin, and you have not seen them waver. If anything, I think they've become a little bit even more passionate, just in, like their demands for something better. The uh, MLS uh, Players Union put out today the numbers, and FC Cincinnati has the fifth highest per the Players Union numbers payroll in the league. They do not have the fifth highest results in the league so that's the big question here like the march is going to be sick the fans are going to love it tql stadium is absolutely gorgeous like every bit of media i've seen uh every person i've talked to every every sort of like impression of this is just highest quality Mm -hmm. and that's so incredible to to see and take for granted because I do think we take these things for granted and I and I wasn't here in the like darkest darkest days of MLS but I was here when it was I mean we probably had half the teams when I started with this stuff. So to see it get here and to see us look at a team in Cincinnati and be like, "Oh yeah, they have one of the best stadiums of that size in the world." Uh, is absolutely incredible. But when will they have one of the best teams in the world? What what is at stake, Charlie, for FC Cincinnati as they move into this new home as they try to be Something, frankly, that they haven't been, which is successful on the field. There's a lot at stake. There'll be changes in the front office, a number of them, if this goes wrong, because it it, it has gone in the wrong direction. So from Yap Stam's point of view, am I getting the most out of my squad? You brought in all these players that you wanted. So what does that culture look like? What does that style of play look like? Because from, from all accounts, you don't know what you're going to get. Are you going to get the team at the MLS's back tournament where they have to bunker, l- legit play? Let's let's park two buses in our own 18 to get a result. If we win 1-0, if we tie 0 zero, great. And, and that's the kind of way that you, the expectations that you've set for that season. And then this year, you add some Brenner. You you have Lokata. You have Yuya Kubo. You, you, have, you draft Calvin Harris, a young, dynamic, attacking player. Where is the attacking flair and where are the ideas that you had, the defensive principles that made you a, a tough team to play against in the MLS's back tournament when you didn't have talent defensively? You think you brought in those reinforcements now to have a more complete team? We haven't seen that. So there are many questions that have yet to be answered. So you have that. And then you also have the fans' perspective where – we're coming in to support this club, to support this team. This is our city. We, we identify with this club. You represent our city. Put something out on the field that we can be proud of. You don't have to win every game. We're not asking you to win a championship, although that's what we're striving to, to win. But put out something that we can say we're going to hang our hat on, on that performance. You, we could see that you represent us on the pitch. And, now, I, th- uh, well, and, I, and I think there'll be a little bit of – like reciprocal, whatever I'm trying to say there. Reciprocal. Right. reciprocal. Yeah, where, reciprocal. I like that though. Yeah, receptacles, because <laughs> yeah, everyone's throwing away all their things. Uh, where we've seen teams, when they get good environments and stadiums, get results at home that Cincinnati can use, right? This is a team that needs every half chance, every half advantage they can get. And so now being in this home environment, having that atmosphere, I mean, we you saw it when KC opened up and obviously they were a good team. They went on to win MLS Cups, but... That new stadium was a huge advantage for them. We saw when Portland came into the league when they they weren't great teams, but they were still able to get home results because of the environment and atmosphere. I think that's going to be a help for Cincinnati, right? To have this big home field advantage that you can rely on. You have a tough away game. Well, we know we're going home. We know what we're going to get. I think that's going to be really big for this team. I think it's going to help. The other thing I'd say is if they do bunker like they did, they've got so much more talent to make it effective now. So you don't have to open up and go and play. Like if you're countering out of a bunker, but now you've got Matarita at left back, you've got Lucho Acosta, you've got Brenner to stretch the field, you'd probably be better at it. So it's sort of the other thing is make a decision. What's your group? Because I think Jeff Cameron's a big help, as we talked about on Monday, when he gets there. 
at center back. Right now, they don't have the center backs to open up the game and play. And they don't have the ability to, to defend on set pieces either. So when they get caught and they get thrown into a foul in a dangerous area, they're then giving up goals after that. So I think you have to protect those two until Jeff Cameron's available for your team or until you bring in even another piece or Vallecia, whatever it is. And you have to be conscious of that and say, well, if we do sit in counter or we do sit in a block, we've got dangerous pieces that could hurt in transition, which they didn't have last year. I'm not sure that's the way they want to play. But I think at this point, they have to look really hard in the mirror and just say, we have to, as you said, Charlie, have something cohesive that we can be proud of, that we can rely on. What is it that they can rely on right now, other than the unwavering support of their fans? This club right now has everything apart from the results. They have the fan base. They have the stadium. They have the, the training facility. They have a, a, a roster, though, let's just say flawed, that has talent. They do not have the ability week to week to go out and put something together that will get them results. And, Straight up, don't have it. Just don't and, have it. And, that, and they, ha- they have to find a way to get there, and that's on Yap Stam, that's on Jared Nykamp, that's on this roster. That, that's on the technical side of the club. And they've got a stadium opener that they're probably favorites in. Miami coming off a midweek game, a game that, as we said, took five and a half hours, uh, struggling for results at times and performances themselves. This is an opportunity for FC Cincinnati. They could, one, control the pet play of play in this game, the pace, the way it's played, the ball, and two, this is, I think, their favorites going into this one. Uh, I was there, in case you didn't know, for the march for the very first MLS home game for this team. It was amazing. I hope you guys have a great time, Cincinnati fans. I know I felt so welcome being with you, and I know you'll make everybody who comes out for this one feel that same way. Before we get to Sean Davis uh, and a really important conversation, uh, let's real quick just hit LA Austin. That one's on Saturday. It's the only national TV game on Saturday, though I encourage you to go check out the ESPN Plus games. I don't think we're going to have time to get to that today, but there's some really good ones. Philly Red Bulls, etc., etc. LA Austin, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, Univision, 2DN, and Twitter in English. What are you looking forward to this one, Charlie? What, what's your just take on Chicharito uh, this year? I love the fact that he came into this year with a point to prove. He wanted to redeem himself, and he talked about the mental struggles. We, we And it, it's great because he's opening up um, a, a softer side of the professional athlete that has all the glitz and glamour and all the fame, yet h- how much he, he, he was really struggling with it and the expectations and, you know, to score goals and to see how much he, he cares about the sport and his teammates. And he's, he's just a, one of those, those spirits that, that uplifts you. And so I think he's riding on a high. He's, he feels like he's in tune with the team, the team's in tune with him. And, and there's that, I, I think there's a, a good sync when they attack, they're in sync, they're, they're playing the right balls that they're playing to make him better. They're playing to his strengths, and I, and I think that's how the Galaxy have, have looked. And you throw in Jonathan Dos Santos and Sebastian Legette and some of these, these new players that I think have, have taken a little time to get used to the, the way of MLS, but this team can be, can be, can be really difficult um, to, to go up against because of the attacking options that they have. This is a fascinating matchup to me because I think all, what Austin does well, right, the, the – not predetermined patterns, but the understanding of their the way they want to play and their ability to stretch the field sideline to sideline, that to me syncs up with some of the things this Galaxy team has struggled with, yeah. especially center back play. It's gotten better. I thought Derek Williams has a, had a good debut for them. Saldana has been key defensively and Jonah, as Charlie said, being healthy and being able to start to be Jonah, which is the ground coverage player that we know. Araujo getting older via Fania. It's all gotten better. This to me is the test. An Austin FC team, this isn't LAFC, where it's okay to sit in, I think, all 11 and try and counter and just survive it. This is an expansion team where there's an expectations for the, for the Galaxy, I think, to win and control some of the play of this game. And so it'll be interesting to me how Austin, what they do well, sets up against what the Galaxy struggles have been over the last two, three years. 3.30 p.m. Eastern, Saturday, Univision 2D and Twitter in English. LA Galaxy, Austin FC, a big match there in the Western Conference. All right, let's get to this interview with Sean Davis, the captain of the New York Red Bulls. I said it off the top. This is soccer for all week. I encourage you to go to MLSsoccer.com or the MLS app to see what uh, MLS is doing, but also what clubs and all these communities are doing uh, in conjunction with MLS Works. Um, this month is also really important. It is, uh, it is, it is Asian and Pacific uh, American Heritage Month in the U.S. It's also we're in the midst of an incredibly important public relations campaign. And I think saying that just doesn't ring quite true to me, but an information campaign to remind people that there have been more than 6,600 hate incidents 
uh, reported in the year after the pandemic began in the United States against people of Asian origin. 6,600, and there are thousands more, I'm sure, many thousands, probably dwarfing that number that are just not reported. And a huge proportion of those are happening right now, like this spring right now. Not like eight, nine, ten months ago, hey, that's in the past. Like right this very second, every single day, my wife, her family, myself, we're seeing incidents and saying, my God, could this happen to us? Uh, and a lot of families are saying that too. Sean Davis and his family are among those families. This is an important conversation. I encourage you to listen. We'll be right back. It's an AT&T 5G call to the field, an important conversation we've been having on this show, and we will continue to have. Sean Davis from the New York Red Bulls is here. Sean, welcome to Extra Time. Andrew, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, man, we should have had you before. I mean, did I forget that we had you before? I've been doing this thing for like 10 years, so sometimes I, I space out a little bit. Yeah, well, if you ask my comms team, you know, that's exactly how I like it, you know, a little more low key. But like you mentioned, this is an important uh, topic. Uh, It's important to me. So really happy to be here. And thanks for having the conversation. Yeah, if you missed the intro there, this is uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It's soccer for all month. It is uh, in the midst of a public relations campaign that's much needed. And I don't think making enough noise as it needs to be made. I mean, stop AAPI hate. And if you don't know what AAPI is, it's Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States, uh, is very real. I know in my family, Sean, we see every day images, video, uh, stories that are downright terrifying. And I'll be the first to raise my hand right now. I did not know you were Asian, man. So give people a little introduction (laughs) to your background, to your family, uh, to who you are. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my full name, Sean Akira Davis, I think that's the, the only time people might get the hint that I'm, I'm uh, Asian, um, but I'm actually half Japanese uh, from my mom's side, and then I'm British and Irish from my dad's side. And super proud uh, to be half Japanese. Again, people are constantly guessing uh, my heritage, and they're constantly wrong. And so I think uh, it's a little bit unique, but uh, something, again, I'm, I'm super proud of. And Um, You know, like I mentioned and appreciate the introduction, but this is a a super important month. And especially when you start to look around MLS, uh, there's not too many Asian players, you know, off the top of my head. Uh, Subasa Endo, who's a good friend of mine, who I actually saw um, during a trip to Japan. Uh, Kubo uh, in uh, Cincinnati. And actually, I was watching the LAFC game last weekend and I saw, I believe it's pronounced Moon Wan uh, make his debut. And so... Um, You know, just thinking about uh, the month, thinking about what's going on in our country, uh, especially within the last year, um, you know, it makes me uh, appreciate the guys within the league and the diversity that we have. But we're obviously a much smaller pool of players uh, compared to, um, you know, the super successful uh, group that's come together, Black Players for Change. So um, long way of saying, yes, I'm I'm Japanese and proud. And, um, you know, like I said, just really happy to have this conversation, happy to learn. You know, I'm learning every single day, trying to educate myself as well. And um, yeah, like I said, Andrew, I, I appreciate you having this conversation. I, I was on this show a couple, maybe a month ago now and, and kind of put out a, a plea, honestly, to people to be mindful, to be aware, to understand what is happening here, what is happening in the world when it comes to acts of hate and aggression and um, the feeling of otherness that has been through the political sphere, through the social sphere, applied to people of Asian descent, to Asian people. And it's terrifying, and it's really difficult in my family right now, day to day. I wonder how you have experienced the last year or so, what you have learned, what you are trying to learn, how how this has affected your life and your family's life. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I apologize in advance for rambling, but um, to rewind a little bit, I, I... Again, I'm super proud to be Japanese and I'd love to tell my family's story. And so um, my grandparents, who unfortunately passed away when I was uh, pretty young, when I was around seven or eight. Um, but they, my, my grandfather, he's a, a U.S. Army veteran. He was a translator during World War II. And my grandmother, she was actually um, in an internment camp, um, which, uh, you know, if you ask Japanese Americans, they equate that to a concentration camp in, in the U.S. during World War II. Um, in which Japanese Americans were, uh, you know, taken from their homes and relocated and forced to basically be in prison. And it's a a very dark part of U.S. history. It's not something that, um, you know, you hear a lot about growing up and not something you learn about in history class. Um, You know, same with the Chinese Exclusion Act, but um, it's something very real and, uh, you know, something that was shocking to hear. And 
again, that's part of history, but uh, it, it's important to address. And, um, you know, that's why I think, uh, especially for me, it, it hits home when you see, uh, you know, a lot of the subtle racism that we have towards um, Asians uh, in our country. And, you know, it was super frustrating last year when uh, COVID came about to to hear the anti-Asian rhetoric that the president would use in, in his conferences. And it was just so selfish. And I don't want to get into politics too much, but um, there there is a lot that stems from politics and legislation. But um, to hear that rhetoric, uh, you know, again, it's selfish because he doesn't or he doesn't care how it affects uh, Asians in our country and, you know, how that's going to affect so many people that, have, you know, that are Americans. And, um, you know, I think it's no surprise that you see a lot of anti-Asian hate and um, a little more backstory. My mom grew up in Fort Lee and at the time it was predominantly white. And I remember her telling me stories about when she would go to school, she was one of the few Asian kids and um, she had to get bullied. And I hate hearing those stories. Uh, but also just buying a home on the block. It was very difficult for, for our family. And, you know, I'm a lot more fortunate um, in my situation and in my childhood because I grew up in a, uh, in a town with a lot of Asians. And so, and also at the same time, like you mentioned, you didn't even know that I was Asian. And so I don't feel like I suffer from Asian, uh, that Asian rhetoric or insults um, as much as other people do. But when I think about it affecting my mom, that's when it really hits home. And, um, you know, to talk about my mom a little bit more, you know, when I was graduating college um, and my brother was in college, my parents were thinking about moving. And at the time, this was back in 2011, uh, maybe a little later. And my mom was talking about how uh, she was scared to move, um, especially to the South. And, you know, my dad wanted a huge plot of land. He wanted to live on a farm, but my mom was scared. And Personally, I, I remember thinking, I, you know, mom, I think you're being dramatic. And then, um, you know, but it's important. It was important for me at the time to try to understand, you know, where those feelings came from. And that came from her childhood and, and her upbringing. And also then I see what's going on, um, you know, in Atlanta, uh, when, in terms of anti-Asian uh, hate crimes in Atlanta, in New York City. And to know that my mom goes to New York City all the time um, to visit my sister's to visit my my niece, my nephew, um, and to feel uneasy about that, I think that's when it really hit home. And you know, part of me um, feels a little ashamed that it it took so long to understand how my mom was feeling. Um, but at the same time, I'm just happy I realized that this is very real. And you know, I wouldn't want my mom to be walking around New York City alone or on the subway alone. Um, and that's a scary thought. And so I think that this is all brought. Um, you know, the, like I mentioned, the, the silver lining through all of this is just being able to take a step back and realize that I need to continue to educate myself on, uh, you know, what's going on. And, you know, whether that's listening, reading, having conversations, you know, I think having conversations is um, the best way to organize your thoughts. But, um, yeah, that's a, a long winded feeling, a, a long winded answer about how I'm feeling uh, on this subject. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective as well, Andrew. Like you said, your wife is is Asian and um, you were in the city for so long. And, um, you know, I, I'd appreciate your perspective and, and what your family's been through as well. Well, I, I would say that that listening is and I, I in this show, I, I called people to action. and I said, look, if you hear something, if you see something, you need to be an ally in the sense that you're willing to take action. But <clears throat> I really think the first step is the listening. And that's the action that people have to take to understand, to empathize with what is a reality, even if you are not a person who has been the target of an act of hate or of aggression or comments or glances or whatever it is out there, there's a feeling and it's a legitimate real one right now. And, and that's what we need to have people understand that that possibility is very real everywhere you go. And that possibility affects the lives of the people around you. It affects the lives of my wife. I'm sure it will affect the lives of my sons as well. And, and it's terrifying for me. And I need people to understand that sort of fear and where fear comes from. And that fear comes from not feeling like our country or our society or the people around you will, will step up or are, or are saying no more or, or are on that side of just expressing that this is unacceptable and that they want to be a part of the solution. I, I think that you were kind of spot on in, in what you said about, um, at least in this league, but overall in society, Asians have not occupied maybe the same sort of like 
th there's like a hierarchy of like, we're going to listen to these problems and prioritize these problems. And of course, every problem is massive and important. But there comes a time now where people need to feel and hear and know that there is that support, that there is that condemnation, that there is not going to be a large subset of who we are as people and as a society and as a world that just accepts the fact that that our, our that other people can get bullied or pushed around or physically harmed and shrugs it off. Like that's what this awareness to me is about, is about banding together as a group of people and saying, no more. This is a problem, first step, listen, understand, empathize, know how it, how it affects people. Two, figure out how you're gonna be a part of the solution. And that may be small. And I think it has to be small. It has to start with just like my acquaintance on Facebook is putting put out a, an image of like a covid meme that's racist and offensive that might be somebody you barely know that might be your brother that might be your uncle that might be your best friend in high school whatever it is but if those things go unchecked that's how you get the groundswell that we've had in the last year or so and that's where we get to the point where these conversations have where have always been relevant but are just beyond crucial for the health and safety of people and that's where it starts to get scary for me and and I'm in a position where I don't want to talk too much. You know, I, I want to listen to my wife. I want to listen to her family. I want to support. I want to, I want to find a way to, to evolve our society and our mindsets so that my sons don't have to have this weight on their shoulders that other people don't have to have, that I never had to have, that, that privilege that this society sort of blessed me with. Everybody should have that sort of carefree, like I can go places, do what I want, live my life without having the fear of walking on the subway and getting punched or stabbed or stared at or just something said. I mean, I feel like I'm the one rambling now, but it, it is, a, it's terrifying. It, it really is. And it, and it is so much based in history. It's not just the president. It's not just our recent president. It is the, it is the foundation of this nation in so many ways and we have to be the ones that start to dismantle that and destroy it. And I, I hope we're on that path. Um, it's, it's crazy to hear about your family's history and all these different sort of molds and folds to it where, you know, your grandfather's serving in the army during World War II while your grandmother is essentially, as you said, in prison for no crime that she committed. And those are the sort of nuances right. that, that we all have to, to dig into and try to understand and, and step back from and say, our perception of the United States and of ourselves maybe isn't always accurate. And it's on us to then put out the way we want to be and the way we want our society to be. For sure. And I think, uh, you know, there's a couple like really great points that you bring up. And, you know, the first thing I'll say is that there's this perception that, uh, you know, Asians are, are the model minority in our country and they're quiet, they keep their head down and they work hard. And, um, you know, for me during a time like this, and, you know, I think this is something that I can encourage for my friends within the league like Subasa, is that we need to speak up and we need to talk and we need to have conversations. And um, yeah, Subasa, people need to hear about your experiences because I think like you've been in this country for a long time and um, you found success and you've worked extremely hard to get where you're at, but you've also had to deal with a lot of obstacles. And I think like storytelling is uh, a really powerful tool that we can use um, to help people understand, you know, what we've dealt with, you know, whether that's um, on the field, off the field, it doesn't matter, but hearing from us uh, is extremely important. And I think that that's uh, you know, one of the, the best qualities from uh, that I take from Black Players for Change uh, within MLS and what they were able to um, create and to see their presence, I think, was really admirable. And, you know, that's one thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, when the anti-Asian hate crime started to pick up in, the, in, in New York, I remember being in preseason and, you know, we have a lot of time in the hotel room where uh, you're reading things and maybe seeing things on the news and, you're extremely frustrated and I'm thinking, what, what can I do? Like, I feel like, uh, you know, a little lost here. And that's where I reached out to reach out to Justin Morrow. And, um, you know, he's given me some great direction and, um, you know, it's great to hear that the, that the league has, uh, has formed a, an ERG for, um, Asian heritage. And, um, you know, it's nice to know that you're not alone in, in this process and that I can come on a podcast like this and talk about it because I think that's the most important step. And there's a lot of lessons to take from, you know, black players uh, for change, um, but also from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in general. And I think that, um, you know, looking, reflecting back on last year, you know, it was my first year as captain and so many things were thrown our way, um, you know, soccer, but 
more importantly than soccer, just racism and, and inequality. And, you know, I had a, a teammate at the time, Kendall McIntosh, who was extremely helpful. And, you know, we had, uh, we, we had a, a meeting basically amongst the players and uh, just to talk about racism, to hear from the black players and to hear about their experiences. And then after a couple hours, we brought in the, the staff and to hear from the staff, like even our assistant coach, um, Bradley Carnell, who's South African and played for the national team during apartheid. Like it was just fascinating to, to again, hear these stories and what people have gone through. And I think that that's a really powerful tool that we have to continue to tap into. And, and it's not always comfortable talking about racism. Um, but it, if people are willing to listen, then I think it's extremely important that we're willing to talk and, um, you know, not only, uh, talk about our experiences, but also hear from people like yourself about what's going on and, you know, what can we do to make a difference? And so um, that's why I think something like this is, is so powerful. I think one of the things I constantly go back to in my conversations with my wife and also just trying to, to really understand and think back on my own life is that it's not always these big things. It's not the image that you see in New York City of, you know, two elderly women basically being attacked with hammers. It's, it's the little slights. It's being it's being stared at. It's being made to feel like, oh, why are you here? It's, you know, it's it's the little things that kids do that are learned from our society that just say you're not like me. You know what I mean? And I think we've all we've all experienced those things as kids, whether we're part of them or the target of them, whether it's because of our race or something else. That's the part that like I think that we all need to internalize just a little bit more. It's not about you having to be the person that steps in between somebody with a hammer. Although, hey, look, if, if, you, have, if you feel that you have that yeah. sort of strength, do that. If you see something happening in your community that is wrong, that is violent, that puts another person's health at risk, please find a way to support them or de-escalate or protect them. But it's the little things that add up, these microaggressions that just make people feel like, one, the target feels different, and two, it starts to become ingrained into who we are as a society and what we're willing to accept. And that's, to me, what so much of this is about, is saying, we're not willing to accept this. This can't be the reality. Right. And there are enough of us that feel that way, that if we band together and we're the ones saying it as you have, and I think it's extremely admirable coming out here and, and sharing those things, but if we start talking about it, if we normalize this idea of this being wrong or all of us standing up to protect other people, that's what will be the norm. That's what will start to, to shift some of those tides. And I know we'll never get rid of it. But those are the little moments that I just want people to be aware of, whether they're the ones doing it or the people around them are or their acquaintances are or the person they don't know in the grocery store. Like there are a lot of moments to show those, those, that support and to show that you understand and empathize and to listen. And I would encourage everybody to do that. The other thing I want to do on this podcast is also celebrate your mom is a star, man. She's a star. I had to delete TikTok <laughs> off so. my phone because I was wasting way <laughs> too much time on it. But I just had to go back and check it out. I'm about to make those air fryer chicken wings. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so we should celebrate your mom too as we talk about some heavier topics. Yeah. Like she's doing some awesome stuff. Yeah, well, you know, just to wrap up a few points, uh, you know, again, I think one of the silver linings out of all this is is the solidarity um, that it brings about and how, you know, not only can the black community come together, but so can the Asian community. And we can also work together as allies. And I think that's how, uh, you know, we can really become even more effective, in, you know, in our pursuit for equality. Um, but, it, you know, in talking about celebrating, I, I think my mom, I do, I know my mom is happy that I'm on here speaking about this. And I know that she'll be happy we're bringing her up because she's a, a star and, She's a hundred times more famous than I am right now. And, um, you know, my brother, he's the brains behind the operation and he helps her, um, you know, with the script and with the editing. But for, for listeners, my mom's extremely famous on social media on TikTok uh, specifically um, cooking her handles, cooking with Linja. And um, yeah, she's she's just the best. And um, yeah, it's been a really fun year for her, um, despite what's going on and uh, my brother has used quarantine to really sharpen up his editing and shooting skills. And it started with innocent videos around the house to to help my retired parents stay active. Um, and it's evolved into something much bigger than that. And now every time I go home, they're shooting videos, they're practicing <laughs> recipes. And 
my mom's a perfectionist and she has to try recipes and perfect recipes multiple times before she shoots them. So um, she is very authentic and, um, you know, it's been a, a lot of fun for the family without a doubt. And, you know, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I was in preseason and Danny Royer is one of my close friends and um, he was, re he was um, approached by um, this place in New York City called Taiyaki. It's a, a very famous uh, ice, a Japanese ice cream place. And they wanted, and he wanted to work with the the owner wanted to work with the Red Bulls um, for an anti for an AAPI anti Asian um, hate awareness uh, event. And um, Danny's like, hey, I think you know this is perfect for you to handle. So he passed it over to me. And when I got talking to uh, talking with the uh, owner immediately, he just wanted to work with my mom. And so <laughs> now I have to be very I have to be very careful about when I bring her up because she just steals the spotlight. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun for, for all of us and to see them grow. But like I said, she's way more famous than I am. And she's the, she's the true star of the family right now. I, uh, I appreciate now that any recipe that I make is going to be tested in the lab. It's been in the laboratory. It has been perfected. Yes. There is no possibility that anything could go wrong with that. And if it is, it's my own doing. We were talking about before you jumped on here and we started recording uh, your trip to Japan. And I remember seeing, I think it was on probably Aaron Long's <laughs> Instagram, Aaron <laughs> and Tim Schmiel and you sort of like off season yeah. cavorting around Japan. That's a different experience than we've all had in the last year and a half but i, I do want to hear from you what right. what that trip meant to you like what connections you made there what you took away yeah for sure and uh you know it's something i have no problem talking about it was a trip of a of a lifetime and we all love traveling and i remember discussing with the guys you know what we wanted to do and, and tim specifically was getting ready to start um start up in the real world so he was on a world tour and so we met him in japan and I, I remember Aaron had a national team camp, so he met us a couple days late um, in Tokyo. But I just remember it being um, an unbelievable experience. It's the first time, I mean, I, I feel like I've traveled to a, a decent amount of places, but it's the first time I felt like I was in a different world, you know, that Japanese culture is so unique. Um, and again, I, I felt even more proud of, of my heritage um, after visiting uh, different cities. But we got the rail pass. We tried to do it right. Um, I think the most important thing was that we had a, a friend there um, who was a local, one of Tim's friends, who, who's now all of our friends. And he was able to make the reservations for us. And, um, you know, every culture has its pros and cons, right? But there were so many um, admirable things about Japanese culture. I remember one of the first uh, days we were there, you know, we were super jet lagged and we were staying um, at a friend's place and him and his girlfriend had work and we were getting home extremely late. And so we went to a, a florist and when we were at the florist, we tried to pay, pay with a card and it wasn't working. And they tried everything in their power to make it work. And they moved mountains, you know, they were, they were doing anything possible um, to, to try to accommodate us. And I think that's when I, I started to realize that, um, you know, there's some awesome um, characteristics of, of Japanese people. And one of them is, is simply the customer service. You know, they're so kind there. One time we were, uh, we got on the wrong train. It got us to the right destination, but maybe it was the express versus the local and we didn't have the right ticket. And, um, you know, they, they, the conductor, uh, caught on to that and they immediately phoned the station in, in Tokyo and said, Hey, listen, three American, I'm sure they said three <laughs> Americans, uh, you know, on the, on the, on car, whatever. And right when we got there, the guy was there waiting for us and he took us to the booth and he, he helped us purchase the, the, the right ticket. But, um, yeah, I was just blown away by how kind and thoughtful um, people were there. And, um, you know, obviously the food was amazing and uh, we just had such a great time. And so, you know, especially with what happened with the world last year, I, I'm extremely grateful that we were able to take a, a trip to Japan. And, um, you know, one final thing. Um, my grandfather, who I spoke about earlier, he, his family is from Hiroshima. And so we had the rail pass, which allows you uh, for seven days to take any train, um, not for free, but um, at, a, at a lower cost, wherever you need to in, in Japan. And so the guys were uh, super cool about it. And I told them, listen, I have a special connection to Hiroshima. And obvi obviously it was hit with an atomic bomb during World War yeah. II. Um, but that's where my grandfather's family was from. And so it was important for me to get there. And um, again, it was a little bit out of the way, but the guys were um, happy to go there. And we went to the um, museum there and 
it was an emotional experience for sure, but something that uh, I think we're really happy that we did. And, um, you know, long story short, it was just a great trip. And, um, you know, I, I'd love to go back there. I know Aaron wants to. There's a few spots that we missed. Um, so I'm sure we'll be, we'll be back there one day. I think that's a good reminder to everyone that, that history shapes the present and that we all have to, in, in pursuit of this conversation, examine the history of our country and of our own families and, and what the history will say about the present in many years from now and how we can be a part of affecting that. And I just want to say, Sean, thank you for coming on. Thank you for being so open about your family, about your history, about your own background and, uh, and about the last year and how it's affected you. I, I do want to talk soccer real quick before I let you go, man, because I really yeah. like this Red Bulls team. You guys are young. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, we had Gerhard Struber on here and he's like, my young wolves are hungry. And now we're just like in, <laughs> in the group chat being like, man, the young wolves of the Red Bulls got it done this week. And like, tell me what it's like to be with Gerhard and, and with this young group. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, I think he was saying young bulls, not young wolves. Oh, uh, was but he? I know his uh, accent. Is, <laughs> his young accent wolves is sounds so much like we just imagine this pack of wolves, like hungry wolves, like pressing. Yeah. And yeah, was, <laughs> I think I might stick yeah, with wolves, works, not going right? to lie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. Uh, but Gerhard's great. And uh, I really enjoyed working with him. And his energy is, is contagious. And I know the guys love him, but uh, it's been an exciting start to the season. Uh, you know, we, we've certainly experienced a lot so far, and um, I think we've come a long way since the start of preseason. We had a slow start um, with Kansas City and, and LA Galaxy, and I try to remain as unbiased as possible, but I do think that there were a lot of positive takeaways from the, from those first two games, and there was a good foundation to build on, and it was just a matter of bringing it all together. And, and for the way that we play – it requires such intensity. It re requires such a high atten attention to detail um, that you really have to stay tuned in and locked in for 90 minutes if you want to get the result. And I think that um, we were punished in those first two games. And, you know, that's how that's how it works in this league. And so um, for us to turn it around and then, you know, against Chicago and Toronto put in uh, more complete performances, I think it shows that we have an exciting team right now. You know, I, I think that, um, we're underdogs in a way for sure, but I think we're fun to watch. And, you know, even talking to Gerhard and talking to the staff and the players, we had a workshop and in that workshop, we talked about, you know, our, our goals as a team, our goals as players, the expectations, but we also talked about, you know, what do we want the fans to think about us after each game? You know, what do they, what do we want them to take away from each game? And, you know, there's a wide array of, of answers, but um, I think the main ideas were that we want to be a fun team to watch and we want to be warriors and we want to be guys that leave it all on the field. And we want to show the fans how much we care about the club, how much we care about them and how much we care about each other. And I think that um, if we can continue to tap into that mindset, it, it gives us a, a great chance against anybody. All right, man. It's been great to chat. been great to meet you as well and hear about your life and your family. Best to you and uh, the TikTok star in your life as well. Uh, it seems like the, the family yeah. business is off and running, man. I'm going to go make some of those recipes. I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. But I appreciate you. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, Andrew, thanks again for having me. I, I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks for covering this topic and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Big thanks to Sean for sharing uh, of his family and of himself, I think one thing that I would encourage everyone to think about, um, in addition to, of course, the present and what's happening right now in this moment, is the past and the history and how it informs all of this. The dichotomy between his grandfather and his grandmother, one a U.S. Army veteran in World War II, one interned in camps, a citizen by this government. Um, remember that those things didn't just happen, but they continue to influence people today and continue to... Uh, to have a real role in the way that people are perceived and the way people are treated in our country. So big thanks to Sean for joining us. I encourage you to go check out uh, Stop AAPI, AAPI Hate. Uh, and I will also say a big thank you to the ERG here at MLS uh, that is organized, uh, that is representing itself and pushing us to have big conversations like this and to think in a real way. And so two things I'd say. One is I encourage you to there's also a lot of work being done. Come back to Chinatown and all of the uh, Asian American restaurants and businesses that have lost so much because not just COVID, but as Andrew said before, uh, the blame and the way people have handled it. The other thing I'd throw out there, shameless plug here, is I've known Sean Davis since he was in the Red Bull Academy. I love Sean Davis, incredible person. 
If you want to see the next Sean Davis or Tyler Adams or Gio Reyna, I will be on the call for Red Bulls U15s and U17s versus NYCFC U15s U17s on Saturday on the Red Bull YouTube channel. So if you're ready, next Tyler, the next Gio, and you're watching MLS on TV, just throw us on the laptop alongside. It's going to be pretty fun. So, yeah, there's that. Juice, juice those numbers. Big thanks to Sean. Uh, we're going to get out of here because we ran out of time. Yeah, hit us on the mailbag for next week, 412060 MLS, time The one thing I'll say is that we found out that Winnemucca is a gold mining town in nowhere, Nevada. And uh, I can't remember who hit us up from Winnemucca. He didn't put yeah. it in the most recent text. But he says, you bet he's mainlining Quakes Ball every weekend up there in Nevada. So, hey, thank you so much, Charlie, Dave. Dave G and Sean Davis. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you on Monday. So you made it through and even enjoyed more than an hour of MLS talk with extra time driven by Continental Tire. That means that you should go subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to them. And you should also check out more extra time on the MLS YouTube channel. If I can uh, point right there, yeah, click right there and subscribe to the MLS channel right here. Have a great day, folks.